Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa afdhil salati wa tamma taslim ala sayidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillahi alladhi an'ama alayna bi ni'mati al-iman wa al-islam wa hadana bi sayidina wa mawlana Muhammad alayhi min Allah ta'ala afdhil salati wa aska salam. I want to apologize for starting late. I uh, was unaware that I was supposed to uh, start an hour earlier today. That's why you're supposed to look at the schedule in the morning. So forgive me uh, for doing that. I did not mean to keep you waiting. Alhamdulillah, uh, this morning, uh, those of you who are this mor here this morning, we uh, went over the seven degrees of the soul. And we talked about the difference between the soul and the spirit. The nafs and the ruh. And at one level, they're one and the same. But the soul, the heart, the spirit, the intellect, when I say intellect, I don't mean the faculty that allows you to memorize data points. I mean the faculty that allows you to discern truth from falsehood, obedience from disobedience, and to follow that. When we speak about the the spirit and the lub, the sir. At the most fundamental level, they are one and the same, but they differ in their attachment. So we talked about this, what they're attached to. If that subtle entity within you is attached to desires, to, to, to wanting to be a leader, to wanting to be uh, the first, to wanting uh, money and fame and fortune, no matter the cost, that part of you that gets offended and insulted and takes personal offense when people don't talk to you the right way or treat you the right way or they don't include you, that's, it's called the nafs. But when it's attached to proofs and evidences that demonstrate what is true, then it's called the aql, the intellect. And at this point, it's able to restrain the anger and the desire for food, drink, and uh, relations with the opposite sex. When it's attached to the hereafter, it's called the qalb, the heart. And then when that subtle entity within you is attached to nothing except the creator of all that exists, it's called the spirit. Right? So, at the most fundamental level, they're all one, but we speak about them uh, as separate to help us uh, in, uh, in understanding them. Just as we, when we speak about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the names of Allah are not separate entities, it's all one, it's Allah. And when you know Allah, you know that there's no separation between our Rahman, our Rahim, and Malik al-Qudus. It's all one. But we talk about these names, and Allah's given us these names because we're human beings. And human beings like to think about things in compartments and categories, and it makes it easier for us. Tayyib. So we're on page 113 of the uh, packet, and this is towards the, is this is Appendix G. No, I'm sorry. Appendix F. Alhamdulillah. Thank you all for your dua. My voice is coming back. Alhamdulillah. I'll be able to yell at my children again. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Uh, real quick, while you're looking for that, some qu uh, questions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. A brother asked. The linguistic connection, what is the linguistic connection between fakara uh, and kafara? And the spiritual significance of this for us with regards to the importance of tafakkur in our lives. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf reflected that if you are not doing one, for instance, uh, fakara, then you are doing the other, kafara. MashaAllah, it's a very beautiful uh, linguistic indication. And if, if you study the Arabic language, as you increase your knowledge of the Arabic language, you'll find that words that share the same huruf, even though the, uh, the, the arrangement may be different, they have connections. For example, the word bahar, 
Bahar means what? Ocean, right? And an ocean is something that's vast, that's expansive. If someone has a lot of knowledge, we call them Bahar. But if you switch the words around, the letters around, uh, you get the word Hibr. And Hibr indicates two things, ink, right? Ink, and it also indicates an alim, a scholar. Because a scholar has vast knowledge, and ink is vast, and there's a connection between ink and knowledge in the Quran, even though Allah uses the word midad in the Quran, the meaning is there that if all the oceans were ink, they would not exhaust the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you change the letters around again, you get ribh, which means prophet, right? And prophet is something that's it's positive, it's vast, it increases, people make lots of money, and inshallah they spend it in good, in khair, to serve Allah's creatures. Uh, and uh, if you uh, change the words around again, you get harb, right? War, right? And war again is something that is avim. It's great, even though it's, it's usually negative, uh, and it comes at great consequence. And um, you can go on and on, right? Barih, and I mean, there's so many. You could change ba, ra, and ha to so many ways. So, kafara and fakara indicates the faculty of reflecting and thinking and meditating and contemplation. And each letter in the Arabic language has a meaning. If you go deep in your study of the Arabic and if you look at a qamus very, very well, you'll see that words that have the same first two letters change the meaning slightly with the last letter in the jidr. And letters that have the same last letters, the ayn and the lam letter are the same, the meaning slightly changes with the fa letter. So, faqara and kafara have the same letters, fa, kaf, and ra. And fa in Arabic it indicates farqa, uh, separation. It also indicates fat, opening. And you'll find that words that have these letters have an it meaning, you just go through all the words you know in Arabic, especially the ones that begin with fa, you'll see that they tend to have a meaning of opening or separation, like fata, fatir, fatih, fatik, right? Uh, fakka, you, yafukku, splitting, and all of these. And then kaf indicates the meaning of going in and, and carving out a space within something else, like a, like a kaf like a cave, and the raw indicates tikrar, repetition, okay? So when you're meditating, you are opening up faculties within you and you're separating yourself from focusing on the physical only, and you are going deep within yourself, and this is an action that's done over and over and over again. And then kafara, kufr, is, has similar meanings, but the, the Priority is different, right? Because the person, kafara literally means to dig a hole and to cover something, right? So this is, again, the kaf is there, you're digging, right? You're going inside, the, you're separating, right? You're separating when you dig, you cover, you're separating earth from itself. And then raw, you know, usually when you farm, a, a, a farmer used to be called a kafir, right? Before it was called a disbeliever. So, Kufr has the meaning of farming, has the meaning of ingratitude, and has the meaning of denying truth uh, that we call disbelief. So what Sheikh Hamza may have been uh, referring to was the fact that if a person is not contemplating in, in reflection of Allah's blessings, as, as, as we read before from Habib Ahmed Mashur Haddad, reflection, meditation leads to thanks and gratitude to Allah Ta'ala. Right. And the absence of reflection leads to ingratitude. Right. And this is why I think Allah knows best we have uh, people who are so sarcastic and cynical in our world today because they're cut off from Allah, they're cut off from nature, they're cut off from their families, they're cut off from their cultures, their ancestors. And people like this do not reflect and they don't appreciate what's around them because they're always stressed out. They're always angry, and they're resentful. So, and Allah knows best. Uh, someone says, forgive me for the dumb question. There aren't any dumb questions. 
since we can't apply the concepts of the mind to Allah, can we wonder and think about where is Allah? Is he in the heavens on his throne or is he everywhere? Placing him on his throne seems limiting to me. Yes, you're right. And saying he is everywhere is confusing. Yes, you're right. Is it his attributes that are everywhere? Help! With exclamation point. Jazakallah khair. The great Nubian uh, East African Sufi and mystic Dhunun al-Misri who lived in Upper Egypt, which is actually Lower Egypt, right? uh, he said, كُلُّ مَا خَطَرَ فِي بَالِكْ فَاللَّهُ بِخِلَافِ ذَلِكْ Al Kamakal So anything that occurs to your mind, Allah is other than that. Right? So you cannot imagine or fathom Allah with the mind. Allah is beyond the mind. In fact, uh, one of the, the meanings of the root that the name of Allah is formed from the Hamza, the Lam, and the Ha means tahayyur. It's bewilderment. Because the reality of Allah, the reality of God, bewilders the intellect. And this is what has confounded many, many philosophers throughout the history of humanity. Because if the philosopher believes that truth is only arrived at through the rational faculty, through reason, then they may deny that, in, that God does not exist. They may, not, they may deny God's existence, sorry. Because if what is true is only what I can understand with my mind, then therefore what I cannot understand with my mind must not be true. Right? And this is a fallacy. This is a logical fallacy that we do, do not have time to go into. But the basic uh, point here is that you don't think about what... Um, Allah is with your mind. Allah does not exist in a place that is anything like that we can conceive of, whether it's a physical place, a mental place, or a spiritual place. Allah exists outside of time and place. But then Allah also says, He is with you wherever you are. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us with a ma'iyya, with a witness that is beyond time and place and space and time and the physical and the mental and the spiritual. You cannot understand it with the human mind. Allah Ta'ala does not exist in a physical place because to, for Him to exist in a physical place would mean that He would be contained and limited by His creation. And there are no limits for Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. If He is limited, it would mean that He would be in need of that place. And if He's in need of that place, He's no longer a samad Right. He's no longer the one who's mustagnin an kul, wal kul muftakir ilayh. He's the, the one who ha is free of need of all things, and all things are need of him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not exist in a place, because existing in a place would imply change. And we have a sound hadith from the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam, كان الله ولم يكن شيء معه أو لم يكن شيء غيره that Allah was, and there was nothing with him including time and space. So if a person, like some Muslims, mistakenly believe that Allah exists in a place, that would mean that at one time he was not in a place and another time he was in a place, which implies change, and change implies need, and there's so many other logical implications that follow from this. I'll let Sheikh Jihad deal with the Aqidah, you can ask him about that, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah, does exist wherever you are, he says in the Qur'an, but this existence, again, and, this, and where he exists is not physical, it's not spirit, it's not mental, it's not physical. You can only have some glimpse of this reality through the purification of your soul. That's the only way. That's the only way. And when you purify your soul, you will know that he is with you wherever you are. That Sheikh Muhyiddin ibn Arabi says, Oh Allah, you are the one who is with everything and nothing is with you. How does that, that doesn't make sense to the mind. Right? So tayyib. And then some scholars have said that Allah's being everywhere means that he is everywhere with his knowledge. Not that his attribute of knowledge is everywhere and his other attributes are not, no. It simply means that his knowledge encompasses all things. So 
Allah being in every place in the ayah, huwa ma'akum aina ma kuntum, is metaphorical, right? That he's conscious of every time, it, rather, not, not conscious, astaghfirullah, but he is aware and knowledgeable of every time and every place. And that is one understanding of the ayah. I tell you, I th we answered this already. Uh, can we have an example on how to supplicate? As I struggle with this on a daily basis, maybe it is its intimidation of not knowing du'as in Arabic and English. Yes, that might be why. You can pray to Allah in any language. English, Arabic, Urdu, Swahili, uh, Chinese, uh, or, you know, French. Allah created all languages and all languages are a sign of Allah Ta'ala. We should not have this mistaken belief that some Muslims who've changed Islam into their idol think that, uh, that the only uh, uh, sacred language is Arabic and all other languages are languages of kufr. The English is a kafir language, right? And, and this, is, this, is, this is a very bad misunderstanding. Um, Allah understands all languages. And the most important thing for dua is that you humble yourself outwardly when you make dua. You bow your head, you raise your hands, because the sky is the qibla of dua, and the Kaaba is the qibla of salah. You raise your hands to the sky because this is where the mercy descends and the barakah descends. You and you, your heart should be humble and broken and feel need. Just the same kind of need you feel when you're about to get your, your, your dream job or you have your dream house and you want to close on it, there are other people you know, bidding on it, and that need you feel when you're sick and you've been sick for not weeks but months and you can't work, you can't even use the bathroom properly, you can't stand and you want to be healed, that need, that's how your heart should feel when you're in dua. And if your heart is like this, and your body is submissive to Allah Ta'ala, you will understand and taste the hadith, ad-du'a mukhul ibadah. That prayer is the marrow of worship. And if you're a doctor, or you're someone who, someone who understands the anatomy, human anatomy, and the importance of bone marrow, you understand what this means, this hadith means. That, that du'a is what nourishes the entire structure of human worship, of ibadah to Allah Ta'ala. So this is the most important thing. Not saying the du'as in Arabic. Du'as in Arabic are important to connect with the light of the Prophet ﷺ and his presence because the form that he brought Islam in was the form of Arabic because of his mission to the Arabs. The Arabs were at the lowest level of humans at that time. The Persians would call them lizard eaters. They had nothing of consequence even Alexander the Great by power he's, I don't even want to he didn't even want to he didn't even want to conquer the Arabs he considered a waste of his time right they weren't like the Persians they were not like the Africans they were not like the Indians or the Chinese all they had was their language their karam their hospitality their courageousness their eloquence they had these noble qualities and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will to show the rest of the world, to show the Africans, to show the Persians and the Romans, the Byzantines and the Indians and the Chinese that he's going to take these people who know the ways of the desert like the back of their hand, who all, who all they have was their language and make them masters of humanity. So this, is, this was the greatness of what the Arabs became through Islam, through the Quran. And by Allah Ta'ala's uplifting the Arabs who are, at the, who are at the bottom of the barrel of human civilization, He uplifted all of humanity. But Islam is not Arabic. Because Islam began with Prophet Adam salam. And Allah taught Adam salam all of the names, all of the languages. Adam alayhi salam and Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and all of the prophets alayhi salatu salam, they were not Arab, right? Hud was Arab and Saleh, they were ancient Arabs. But you know, the deen is not Arabic. The Quran is Arabic, right? And the more Arabic you know, the better. I, I love Arabic, I love the Arabs. The Prophet said we should love the Arabs. He said we should love the Arabs. 
So we, must, we should love them. Loving them is from the deen. Loving Arabic is from the deen. But don't think that you can only get to Allah through Arabic. Yeah. I've come to understand and I've been taught that Arabic is the closest human language to the language of the soul. And this is why the adhkar and the nasheeds and al-qasar are so powerful. Even for people who don't understand Arabic. I know people who don't understand one iota of Arabic. And when they hear the Qur'an recited by a qari who has a heart that loves the Qur'an and loves Allah, they're in ecstasy. They don't understand a word. Right? Why? Because Arabic, it, it, <clears throat> there's something deep within us that corresponds to the Arabic language. And this is one of the wisdoms why Allah chose it. But dua is done, you know, the key to the dua is a sincere, humble heart that's yearning for Allah. Last question, is there a prayer one should say, okay, we already read this, alhamdulillah. So if there are any other questions, don't hesitate to ask them, inshallah ta'ala. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. So we're on page 113 on remembrance. Um, that's 20 minutes before Q&A or 20 minutes? Okay, shukran. Play, uh, let me know. I want us to do, because there are people who are not here this morning. So I want us to do a muraqabah of Allah like we did this morning. So maybe, just let me know we have 10 minutes left. Yeah, 10 minutes left. Okay, so we're just going to read. And I, I would prefer for you to read these pages. Inshallah, we'll finish them before the end of the retreat on Monday. Or, um, but read ahead and see if you have any questions. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu alayhi wa nabi kareem Habib Ahmad Mashur al-Haddad says May Allah have mercy upon him and benefit us by his knowledge and blessedness Remembrance of God the Exalted People of sound intellect know that this world is a place of constant change and a road that leads to the abode of the afterlife Notice Allah calls the hereafter Dar al-Akhirah the home of the Akhirah When he mentions the dunya you don't see him call it Dar al-Dunya he calls it what? Hayat dunya The life of the dunya. It's, it's important to reflect on this. The akhirah is your home. You're like a fish that was in the ocean and you've been brought into dry land. And the goal is for you to get back. This is why it is called dunya. Short-lived, swiftly evanescent. Dunya means something that's low. Dana. Or it means low and near. So this world is the closest world to us through our physical perception. And this world, the word dunya also has the meaning of a fruit that's low hanging. It looks like it's low, but when you try to reach for it, it eludes you. That's the, that's the nature of this world, a dunya, the lowest world. It looks like it's near, but it's far. It's a mirage, it's just a shadow. The destination is either the garden or the fire. A lifetime, therefore, is a distance to be covered of which the years are its stages. Time and days are a man's capital. While his inclination, his desires, and his various ambitions are the highway robbers. His success is to meet with God, with Allah, and attain everlasting happiness. He loses by being veiled from God in being consigned to the painful torment of hell. So he said a lot here, we don't have time to go into, but your life has seasons. Everyone should understand the seasons of life. And I spoke to the, uh, the, the teenage girls, the adolescent girls about this. There's a book called The Lives of Man. I don't know if Sidi Adul has any more left. Yes, please buy this book, along with the honey. Please buy the, buy the honey, because I want to make sure I, I can leave here. All right, and uh, all right, we may not get to leave with this note. The honey's still there. All right, but uh, the lives of man goes into the five stages of human existence. You should know these. For this reason, the intelligent believer transforms all his breaths into acts of obedience and fills them only with the remembrance of God. 
the man who is guilty of heedlessness, ghaflah, even if only for the space of a single breath in his entire lifetime, exposes himself to endless remorse and irreparable ruin. The Prophet said, the people of paradise will regret a second in this dunya that was not spent in the remembrance of Allah. It's something, it's something to think about. It doesn't mean you have to become a monk or a sheikh or an imam. What it means is when you're in your business, when you're working, when you're playing, when you're sleeping, your intention for all of these is obedience to Allah. Right? It means your tongue is always busy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and thanks and praise and glorification. And if your tongue is preoccupied with things that you need to do to earn a living or to console your, your spouse or bring joy to your children or your brothers and sisters, then your heart is always preoccupied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is what is intended here. Not that you sit in the masjid all day and do dhikr. Otherwise, civilization will come to a halting stop. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has charged us was with imaratul ard, with cultivating the earth and building civilization and society. This is why the single-heartedness are the foremost. Al-Mufradun. Sabak al-Mufradun, the Prophet ﷺ said, or Sabak al-Mufarridun. We read the hadith when we were going over the athkar of Imam al -Nawi. As the Prophet ﷺ has said, he was then asked, O Messenger of God, who are the single-hearted? Al-Mufradun. He replied, the men and women who remember Allah abundantly. Al-Dhaqirin Allah kathiran wa dhaqirat. They are those who forsake the company of people in order to remember God so that they single themselves out from among all creatures as well as their companions to commit themselves to God subhanahu wa ta'ala jala jalalu and to devote themselves to Him in worship in the way that He desires and as He had commanded His messenger and His followers to act in His statement thus mention the name of your Lord of your nurturer rather, and devote yourself to Him. In this way did He point out that continuous remembrance is best accomplished by excellence in devotion and committing oneself solely to Him. God, exalted as He has also said, those who believe in whose hearts find tranquility in the remembrance of God, indeed it is in the remembrance of God that hearts find tranquility. الَّذِينَ amanu. وَقُلُوبُهُمْ تَطْمَئِنُّ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَّا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنَ الْقُلُوبِ It is only in the remembrance of Allah your heart will find peace. Otherwise, you'll always have anger in your heart. You'll always have revenge and resentment and envy and worry and depression and anxiety. And, and this is what plagues human beings. I don't care how rich you are or how wealthy or how famous you are, if you are not in the remembrance of Allah, you will not have serenity, peace, calm, tranquility in your heart. The only thing that will bring your heart peace is the remembrance of Allah Ta'ala. And you must do a lot of it. Because Allah says the hypocrites remember Allah. But qalilan, a little. Even the hypocrites remember Allah, but just a little. So when you do lots of dhikr, the light of the dhikr will, will, will radiate through your entire body and your mind and soul, and you will become baptized, you become washed in the dhikr. Sibghatullah, faman ahsanu min Allahi sibgha. The dye, the coloring, the baptism, the circumcision of Allah. These are all meanings that the ulama have mentioned in the books of tafsir of what sibgha means. The religion, the deen, the milla of Allah, and who is more beautiful at dyeing, at coloring, at baptizing, at circumcising than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the dhikr does. In other words, one finds serenity and contentment. Serenity arises from certainty. 
just as restlessness comes from doubt. And remember, I told you earlier this week that certainty, yaqeen, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts the veil of your inner eye so that you can see the unseen world, the spiritual universe, just as you can see the physical universe, just as you can see me now, Allah Ta'ala gradually opens the eye of your heart so that you can see the world of the angels and the world of, of the, 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 the spirits. So that you go from just belief to certainty. Because when you see something, what, what do they say in English? Seeing is what? Believing. Believing. Now, no one can shake your iman. Because right? you've, seen, you've seen the truth. Right? So Allah says, and we showed Abraham the spiritual kingdom so that he will be amongst those who are what? Yuqinun, certain. Allah showed him the malakut. So you reach certainty when Allah shows you the malakut. And don't think that that's, not, that's something that's difficult for Allah. In Allah, ala kurishin qadir. Allah is able to do all things. The remembrance of God brings tranquility to the hearts of believers and allows certainty to dwell therein. Remembrance is to feel the presence of the one remembered in one's heart and to free oneself from distraction and forgetfulness. This is accomplished by maintaining the heart in a state of constant attentiveness, articulating the remembrance with the tongue and forsaking the fold of unawareness for the wide space of witnessing. And this is what we were doing this morning. Shukran. This is what we were doing this morning. We were learning this. So I'm just going to finish this, uh, this section and then we'll do the muraqaba. Remembrance is the companion in spirit of actions. See how God pairs it with ritual prayer, which is the best of all actions of worship and makes remembrance the very reason for prayer. When he says, Aqimi salata li dhikri, establish the prayer for my remembrance. Imam al Haddad says in one of his poems, Remember your God with the remembrance you never leave, for remembrance is like a sovereign for devotions. Remembrance is the cornerstone of the path, a tariq, <coughs> meaning the spiritual path, the key to realization, the weapon of the seeker and the authentic authentication of sainthood. Dhikr is the alamatul wilaya. When dhikr becomes firm in you, that is the sign of sainthood. When you see a person constantly in dhikr of Allah Ta'ala, that is the sign that they are from the awliya of Allah Ta'ala. That is the sign that they are from the awliya of Allah Ta'ala. When they do not tire of dhikr of Allah Ta'ala, God says, exalted is he, remember me, fadkuruni adhkurkum, and I shall remember you. And the Prophet wasallam said, please, when you hear his name, please, say sallallahu alayhi wa Don't be stingy. Don't forget the one who, it's just for him that we're here. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here. It's only because of Allah guiding us through him that you and I are sitting here. Where else do blacks and whites, and browns, and yellows, Arabs, and Pakistanis, and Malaysians, and <coughs> Koreans, and Chinese, and Africans sit together to learn about God. Most places in the world, when people worship God, they're in separate, you know, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the Sunday, the hour of Sunday service in the United States is the most segregated hour in the country. And it's still like that to this day with all of the integration and all the, the <coughs> civil rights bills because you can't legislate love for other human beings. People will not love other human beings until they love God and they love the prophets and they love themselves. In fact, hating other human beings is a sign of all your own self-hatred and self-loathing because you don't realize that they are you and you are them. All right. Racism is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, just, it's a terrible disease. It's a satanic disease. Because Satan was the first one who hated based on physical attributes. It's an iblisi, it's a shaitani attribute. So when a person 
hates someone or looks down on someone because their, their, their skin is black or you don't want to be out in the sun too long because you don't want to get too dark, right? Or you don't, you know, the caste system and all these things. These are signs of your own self-hatred. Because your own father was black. Adam, alayhi salam, means black. So if you hate blackness, you're hating your, your most ancient ancestor. Right? Adam means black, like dark, dark, dark brown. Not just like light brown. It's not like asmar. Right? It's like dark brown. When they describe Bilal, radiallahu anhu, the biographers say, Adim, shadid al-udma. Right? Like, like dark, dark brown, like extremely dark. And when they, when they describe Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the biographers say, Adim, shadid al-udma. Right? Same words. I know there's all those pictures of Ali that he looks like a Persian, like, you know, like he's from. People, you know, they like to make everyone important to look like them. You know, that's the na human nature. Everyone who's important, she's supposed to look like me, right? This is not the reality. Some prophets were white, some were black, some were brown. There's, you know. But, you know, racism is a satanic disease. And prejudice and tribalism and nationalism, qabiliyya and unsuriya, these are attributes of shaitan and they're based on arrogance. And that arrogance is based on ignorance of haqiqah. And that's why tasawwuf and dhikr is so important. Because the more dhikr you do, the more you begin to realize the reality of things. And the higher you grow spiritually, you realize that we're all one. Actually, we're all one person. Allah created one nafs. One nafs. Ya ayyuhal ladina, ya ayyuhal nafs, ittaqu rabbakum muladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. We're one nafs, we're all one soul. We're, we're in different bodies, but we're in one soul. When I say soul here, we're not talking about the ego. We're talking about the highest soul. We're one soul, but you don't realize that until your soul, this the low ego has been subdued in its surrender to Allah Ta'ala. We're not going to have time for the muraqab, I don't think. Let's, let's do the muraqab, let's stop, inshallah. Let's stop here. We'll just finish the paragraph. So he says, and the Prophet ﷺ said, this is in Hadith Qudsi, a divine narration from God. God the Exalted says, I am as my servant thinks me to be, and I am with him when he remembers me. When he remembers me within himself, I remember him within myself. That's why we did the silent dhikr a few days ago. Right. So we have that honor of Allah remembering us within himself. When he remembers me, uh, and when he mentions me in an assembly, I mention him in a better assembly. Another tradition says, I am the companion of the one who remembers me. Ana jalisun man I am the one, I, li literally the hadith means, I sit with the one who remembers me, who does dhikr of me. Allah, this is a hadith, Qudsi, that Allah sits with the one who remembers him. And what must you think of someone whose companion is God himself? This is a special attribute of remembrance, attending at the exalted presence and att attainment to the rank of proximity which is expressed by being with and companionship. All right, this is the witness that the Sheikh is talking about. You will only understand what it means when you, Allah does not exist in a place. And our brothers and sisters who think that Allah is sitting on a throne, or he's in the heavens, or they're mistaken. Allah created the throne, Allah created the heavens. How can he be in what he created? How can he be in what is contained and delimited by change in time and place and movement? Hasha lillah, subhanallah amma yasifun. All right. So this is the key. Dhikr is the key to being with Allah. And Allah being your Habib, Allah being your beloved, Allah being your Khalil, Allah being your Jalis, your Anis, your intimate companion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is when, and when He is comp your companion, then you, taqwa becomes easy. Taqwa becomes easy. Shukran Sidi. So uh, we're going to do maybe five minutes of muraqabah, just five minutes, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, 
so I, I didn't finish speaking about Adam alayhi salam. So the word Adam, it means black and it means the surface of the earth. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angel Israfil alayhi salam, the angel responsible, I'm sorry, Azrael alayhi salam, the angel of death, Malik al Mauts, to take from the earth every type of earth black earth, red earth, white earth, you know, yellow earth, brown earth, all the different kinds and colors of earth, hard earth, soft earth, you know, wet earth, dry earth, cold earth, hot earth. He took earth from every part of the globe and Allah Ta'ala created Adam and fashioned Adam from this earth. And this is why we have different complexions. This is why we have different personalities. Some people whose hearts are hard, right? And some people whose hearts are soft. Some people whose hearts are cold. Right? You, you know, you people, you know, you're, you, those people, people say, man, that brother's cold-hearted, man. Right? You ever heard people say that? It's cold-blooded. Right? And then some people who, has, who have warm hearts. Now, whether your heart is cold or hard, the dhikr of Allah will soften your heart if you persist in it. Remembering God will... So Adam, alayhi was taken from the surface of the earth and all of this earth was put together, and when it was all put together, its color was adim, was dark. Because when you put every, all the colors together, if you have a, a palette of colors, and you mix all the colors, what do you get? What do you get? Black, right? So if you hate black people, if you don't want your children to be dark, right, you intentionally marry someone who's light-skinned, because people do this, right? African Americans do this, you know, Pakistanis do this, Arabs do this, right? They, they, people, you know, white people do this. I, you know, I don't want them to come out too dark, so. You're not, you, you intentionally look for someone who's light-skinned. This is a, this, your father, your greatest, greatest ancestor who was a prophet. You don't want your children to look like that. Hakif. This is just the height of insanity. So, may Allah give us Allah. Allah give us understanding. So Sheikh Jihad is not here yet, so I'm going to take advantage of that. Because he's always taking my time. <laughs> always. SubhanAllah. And Sheikh Yahya is always taking my time. So may Allah, I love both of those. May Allah, mashallah, may Allah increase our love and our respect for both of them. It's, it's an honor to see um, shuyukh and people who I believe are very close to Allah Ta'ala from the American people from European, from white American people. It's a blessing. You know, they're following in the footsteps of uh, Sayyid Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb. If you don't know about him, learn about him. There's a book that Dr. Umar Farooq Abdullah, who's another great Ameri white American scholar, wrote about him. He lived in the 1800s, early 1900s. Amazing, amazing man. You know, um, he was a, a white convert, early white convert to Islam, and he was, he worked tirelessly you know, for Muslims and for all human beings. And uh, so alhamdulillah, it's just a blessing to have, you know, people like them here, and people with their depth of understanding and sensitivity and, and intelligence. So may Allah Ta'ala increase the likes of them. And Sheikh Tamara Gray as well, you know, another white American scholar. You know, so the more we, the more uh, we have scholars and guides, spiritual guides from the people who founded this country, the more Islam will become normalized and accepted by the dominant culture in the society. But the challenge for our sheikhs and our imams and our, um, uh, uh, our da'is who are white American is to not, not retreat to the communities of African American Muslims and Pakistani and Arab. We have to go to the suburbs, we have to go to the rural areas where Luke and Duke and Daisy and Boss Hogg and, you know, we have to go to these places, right? Some people miss that, that's okay. <laughs> if you watch TV, TV Land, you know, you'll, you know. But we have to go to these places and build masjids there. MashaAllah, there's a hummingbird. There's a hummingbird in the building, MashaAllah. It's a good sign. Um, it, but we have, you know, our white American sheikhs and da'is, and they, we have to build masjids in the in the suburbs, the lily, the most lily white suburbs, 
in the rural areas. We have to. Otherwise, you know, if we're always just in the inner city or just in the suburbs with the, you know Southeast Asian and Arab, the, the Islam will never get to the dominant culture. No. So, inshallah. So we're going to do a quick muraqaba, and uh, please sit up straight. You know, if your body's not hurting, right? If your body's hurting, then you can lie. We'll do whatever you want. You know. And we're just going to do a short muraqaba. Sheikh Jihad's not here, so uh, I wanted to do. I wanted to do it for ten minutes. So, yes. Okay, we'll do it for five minutes. So, could you please, uh, City Mark, could you tell him that we'll be ready in 10 minutes? Shukra. All right, so we'll just do this for, do this for five minutes. And uh, I went into more detail this morning, but. Okay, okay. Okay, inshallah. So, Muraqaba is based on the hadith, the Sahih hadith. Uh, the, where the Prophet ﷺ was, was um, asked by Jibril, by the archangel Gabriel, peace be upon him, in the presence of the, the, his companions about Islam, Iman, and Ihsan and the, and the signs of the end of time, the signs of the last hour. And he answered when he was asked about, so he was asked about faith, Iman, about Islam, surrender, and Ihsan, inner beauty. The beauty of the soul, Ihsan, and Ashratu Sa'a, the signs of the last hour before the earth is transformed and Allah inherits the earth and the heavens. And he said, when asked about beauty, spiritual beauty, which is one of the core dimensions of Islam, Beauty, spiritual beauty, is that you serve Allah, you worship Allah as if you are beholding Him, as if you are seeing Him. And if you do not see Him, know that He is watching over you. Right? That He is watching over you with His love and His care and His concern. Jala Jalalu. So, the first part of this definition that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave us is called mushahada, to see Allah. The, the 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 soul becomes so pure that it becomes like a mirror, and in that mirror, the names and the attributes and the essence of Allah Taala they are reflected, and you know Allah Taala in that place, and it's as if you are seeing Him. <laughs> the second part of the hadith is called muraqaba which means to observe, to observe, because you are aware of Allah's observing you. فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاقُ Know that He's watching over you. So this meditation is a meditation uh, of being aware of Allah's awareness of you. And as for beginners, it really ultimately starts with watching your thoughts, being aware of your thoughts, watching your thoughts, because you'll see all kinds of thoughts racing around in your mind, uh, until your, your body learns to be still and your mind learns to be still, then your soul learns to be still, and then you're able to see clearly in the mirror that, that you are. Because mirrors are made of a part that's transparent and a part that's opaque. You put it together, you have a mirror. The human being is made up of a body that's opaque and a spirit that's transparent. So you are a mirror as well, right? You are a mirror to reflect the essence, the names, and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are the most perfect mirror in creation. So you're going to sit straight, inshallah, put your hands on your knees or your thighs, whatever is most comfortable. If you need a pillow, there are pillows uh, that are here. For those of you who uh, may have sore knees or, you know. And um, you close your eyes and you're going, you're going to visualize the name of Allah especially if you have problems concentrating or if you have ADD or ADHD. Uh, I'm not joking. There are brothers who have come to me who said that they, you know, that they need things to anchor them 
in the dhikr and the fikr. So that's why I'm saying this. Uh, so if you have problems with concentration, you want to see the name of Allah written in large letters. Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha, in light. Imagine your, your favorite piece of calligraphy with Allah's name. Large, big, expanded. See it, try to bring it to your mind right now, Allah's name, or written on a piece of paper, or on a board, or something. See Allah's name in your mind. And while you're doing this dhikr, this fikr rather, this meditation, you start with envisioning Allah's name and asking Allah Ta'ala for permission to be in His presence, to be conscious of His presence, and to be aware of His presence knowing that there's no success, success except with Allah, and then you imagine, you, vi you feel that Allah is watching you. Just like you know when someone's watching you, right? When you're, when you're not looking, you can kind of feel like someone's watching you. Now you want to feel that the creator of the universe, who sees you from every dimension, from every direction. He doesn't just see you from the front, but he sees you from the front and the back and the right and the left and the top and the bottom and inside and outside and from your skin down and from your innermost organs out and from your body, mind and soul. He sees all of these different aspects of you at the same time. He sees the aspect of you that was the spirit that was first created. Bismillah. And the aspect of you that is now, and the spirit, and the aspect of you that will be, inshallah, inter eternally in paradise, <coughs> all at the same time. So we'll do this for five minutes. Uh, is, is our timekeeper here? Our, our dear beloved timekeeper, Amuwakit, inshallah. Crickets, inshallah. So just if you have if you have thoughts other than what you're meditating on, do not fight them. They are natural and they are normal and they will help you know who you are right now. They are a mirror. Meditation is a mirror that will help you see the state of your soul right now. When you close your eyes and you shut your mouth and you stop moving, you'll see the thoughts that are going racing through your mind and that will tell you what your heart is attached to. But you don't have to despair if they are not what you would like to be displayed before people because this is all about transformation. And if you see good thoughts, then thank Allah Ta'ala because He will increase that for you, inshallah Ta'ala. So we'll just take five minutes. Be aware of Allah's knowledge of you. Be aware of Allah's seeing you and hearing you and Allah's encompassing you with His absolute will and absolute power. At the end of the meditation, when we hear the, the, the crickets showing, telling us that it's time, please keep your eyes closed. I'm going to recite Ayatul Kursi and then we'll open our eyes slowly. Bismillah. If you, have a, if you have a thought that takes you away from awareness of Allah's presence, just bring the name of Allah back in front of your eyes, the eye of your mind. And focus on that, concentrate on that as hard as you can.
Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahu la ilahe illahu el hayyul qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun ve la nawm. Lahu ma fi's semawati ve ma fi'l ard. Men zellezi yeşfa ve indehu illa bi'iznih. Ya'lemu ma beyna aydihim ve ma khalfahum ve la yuhitun bi şeyin min ilmihi illa bima şa'a. وسع كرسي السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم. Please remember Allah's name with me as we've uh, done. We'll say لا إله إلا الله three times and then we'll say Allah's name ten times with uh, the mud. Please keep your eyes closed. لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا forget Allah's name ends with a ha. Allah, 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 like that. Allah, 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 Allah. بك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المسلمين الحمد لله رب العالمين والله we ask that you make us amongst those who remember you and those who are remembered by you والله we ask that you make us amongst those whose tongues are always moist with your remembrance and whose hearts are always busy and preoccupied with your remembrance يا رب العالمين والله تعالى make the remembrance of you penetrate our tongues and our hearts in every limb of our body, in every fiber, in every nerve, in every cell of our body, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O Allah, help us to hear the remembrance of creation, as you have said, Sabbaha lillahi ma fi samawati wa ard. That all of creation declares the freedom, your freedom from imperfections and deficiencies and blame and faults, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhana Rabbi Jahi Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 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 سبحان ربك رب العزة أما سيفون وسلام على المرسلين وحمد لله رب العالمين with the intention of acceptance and the healing of our sick and victory over our enemies that are internal and external الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آمين so you should be feeling a kind of uh, tranquility now. And uh, I just want to say these two last things. That if you are diligent and disciplined in your meditation, you will reach a point where you will reach a, a space of deep, deep internal silence. A silence like you, you may you may have never known possible. Even with, if the baby's screaming and the TV is blaring and the subway is going by you and the train, you'll experience a kind of calmness and serenity uh, that Allah Ta'ala 
will bring to you, inshallah ta'ala. You don't have to be special to experience any of these things. Just human. It's just human.